interview November 20th, 1986, with Mr. R.E. Peterson by Fran Nolf and Fred McCruel. Mr. Peterson, will you give us a little um, information about how old are you, Ed? 78 years old, soon be 79. And where do you live? I live eight miles west of Enid on Route 1. Where were you born, Mr. Peterson? I was born a mile east, a mile and a half north of a little town of Mena, Oklahoma, on the farm that my father homesteaded in the opening of the Cherokee Strip. Could you tell us a little bit how your dad made the run? He and his cousin got on the south line and they didn't even have a bicycle or horse or anything. They walked in from the south line to a mile east and a mile and a half north of Mino, approximately 20 to 25 miles across the country. Is this claim still in the family? My younger brother owns the old farmstead, which is a mile east and a mile and a half north of Mino, Oklahoma. Do you remember any hardships your dad might have told you that they endured? Well, one that stands out in mind most is perhaps about the year of 1912. They had three crop failures. One year dried out, one year the green bugs ate it up, and one year it hailed out. They missed three crops in, in succession there. Dad said he could mow a little wheat in the bottoms all to a neighboring trash machine and get a little seed wheat in the better places on the top. He could mow a little and get some horse feed and put the crop back out again. Well, how did the depressions affect your family? What was that? The depression. Well, they about as average went through the depression about like all others, it was a hardship. Wheat was at a low price, cattle was low price, cream and all farm products wasn't bringing much money. But I don't know how they did it, but they made it through the depression and was ready to go in full speed ahead when the depression was over. What about the Dust Bowl? Did it affect them? They wasn't affected much by the Dust Bowl. It was dry some years, but they raised crops right through the area of what is known as the Dust Bowl. Let's go back to your childhood, if you would, and maybe you could describe a typical day in your childhood, and what chores you did, and in your school experiences? Well, when we got home from school, it was about the first thing we needed to do was change to our old chore clothes, old overalls. Go out, gather up wood and kindling that they might keep the fires going, mom could bake and cook and keep the family warm. We milk the cows, separate the milk, run the milk through a cream separator, fed the skim milk to the calves, pigs, and chickens, and sold the cream for the family income to buy groceries and clothing for the family. Could you describe the first home that you remember living in? first home that I remember living in was which we called the Rock House. They hewed out stones. Sometimes I'd like to think of it as diamonds in the rough. Hewed out huge stones. Made them into blocks like and laid them up and built a home. Built a house and that was the first home that I can remember living in. Did your dad build a sod house when he first came? I don't believe it was a sod house. As far as I 
what no I know about it, it was what they call a dugout. He dug a hole in the bank, put a little shelter over it, and he was by himself at that time. He wasn't married, and that's where he lived in this commonly known as a dugout. Do you know how many years he lived in that? He came here in September in 1893, and just when he built the rock house, I'm not sure. But I'm sure he lived in this dugout something like from three to five years. Well, how large was your family? How many brothers and sisters? I had one sister and four brothers. They're all, the oldest one is passed on, but all the rest of them are now living in good health. Well, that's great. When was the first good crop harvested after the run? You told me about those bad years. When was the first good crop? Well, it's probably a little bit before my time, but uh, they, had, they began to raise good crops of wheat and corn and oats <clears throat> at, the, at my earliest recollection, the earliest I can remember, they was growing good crops of wheat and crop of oats for the horse feed, and corn for the livestock. I don't remember, I don't, it's probably before my time that they raised a real good crop. Mm -hmm. Did your folks have their own orchard? We had a small orchard of apples and peaches and a small vineyard, raised some grapes, raised quite a garden of potatoes, just a general run of gardens such as carrots and radish. And other vegetables, which we mother canned up a lot of them. Did you remember her buying anything from mail order catalogs? Well, just exactly the articles, but they did use the mail order catalog somewhat at that time. Enid was about 20 miles away where they could buy most of the merchandise. And horse and buggy, that made it quite inconvenient to make the trip for many articles. A lot of them was ordered through the mail order catalogs, which was articles brought out and shipped out, brought out by the mail carrier. Do you remember what stores they uh, went to when they did go into any of the shop? Well, one that I remember most of they would be known as the Hirschberg store. That seemed to be the one that they traded most for their clothing. Bought most of their articles at the Hirschberg store. Was that one of the first uh, clothing stores in town? In my recollection, it was among the first clothing store that was, came into Enid. Uh, do you have any remembrance of outlaw gangs in this area passing through? Not of any great experience or not anything. There was sometimes a little report of outlaws loose in the area, but we never experienced any bad experience with outlaws. They were captured and taken back to their prisons without any great hardship experience. What about entertainment? What did you do for entertainment back then? Well, it seemed like, of course, church had a few programs, Christmas programs, and like that, and the little rural schools, they would have sort of a literary society, their programs at Christmas time, perhaps last day of school, and that's about as near as I can remember. There wasn't a great lot of entertainment to go to at that time. Did you have revivals or kids shows come through? 
they did put up a large tent there in Mill, and I just can't recall the minister's name at this time, but he was a minister that was in a wheelchair. And uh, that's my earliest remembrance of a revival at the Mino that I attended. What about circuses and rodeos? I can't remember ever attending a rodeo, but I do remember Dad taking us to the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus. At that time, they had parades around the square at Enid. And I was certainly enthused or thrilled to see the big dapple gray horses that pulled the wagons, which heck, had the uh, lions and other wild animals, caged lions and other animals in them. It was certainly an experience for me. I bet they had a big turnout for the parade. Yes, the streets of Enid, of course, there wasn't a lot of people lived in this area at that time. Families later, of course, grew up. But as I remember, the streets were lined with people. And after we got into the tent where the circus was, they brought in bales of hay and broke the bales of hay, straw, broke the bales of straw and spread out where people could sit down. It was an overflow crowd of people there at that circus. I don't remember what year that was. Probably about the year of 1912. I see. That was probably a really big thing when the circus came to town. Yes, it certainly brought a lot of people into the city of England. Do you remember any medicine shows? I believe I can't recollect too much about it, but I believe I have attended several little old medicine shows where they sold their products but i'm not i can't remember too much about them do you remember how you celebrated your holidays <coughs> well uh, they have a pleasant memory of me christmas we usually had the usual thing maybe baked chicken or some food. Christmas, we didn't expect a whole lot. We got a bag of marbles and a rubber ball. That was very enjoyable. Things were quite a bit more simple back then than those days, I guess. More simple things. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. We did have a few mechanical toys, but it wasn't near as extravagant as it is today. Yes. Well, I asked you a little bit about the Depression a while ago. Um, do you have any remembrance of Governor Walton and the Ku Klux Klan? I don't remember too much about them. I, I do remember something about them. They had quite a little activity at that time. But I don't remember a great deal about them. Then. Did y'all have plenty to eat during the Depression, remember? Yes, we had plenty to eat. That is simple food, bread and butter, and fruits and vegetables, and maybe not the greatest variety, but it was something we could make a meal till we satisfy our appetite. Did you know very many people that left the area during the, that time? At this particular area, I don't believe there was many people left. Probably farther west, in the, where the Dust Bowl was a little more severe, they might have left more. But in, right in this area here, I don't think many people left. They most of them stuck it out then, you think? Yeah, it seemed to me like some people more or less came in here. This was a little, maybe a little better than the average, and, and uh, seemed to me like some people began to come into this area. Well, what is your opinion of FDR, Franklin Roosevelt? Well, I think he was certainly 
did what needed to be done or was trying to do what needed to be done to help the people. Some people were very destitute. And uh, he made labor for them. I believe he tried to do what he could to help the people back to normal life. What is your opinion of Social Security? Well, I think it's one of the great things for people, especially for those, that, and naturally those who have grown old and no longer can earn money and uh, perhaps didn't make arrangements to save money. I believe it's a great thing. Do you think that the good old days really were good old days? I think people were happy and uh, enjoyed life at that time. Some of them say, who wants to go back to the good old days, the hard work? But I think there was a lot of, there was very, it was very secure at that time. Now it seemed like here today and gone tomorrow too many times. I, I enjoyed them. I've heard you mention there was no dust on the Bible. Can you tell us a little bit about that in your family? Well, the family attended my earliest recollection of uh, Sunday school. We drove a horse and buggy about five, six miles to Sunday school, church, and the family was always In, uh, family always was related some way or other to church and Sunday school and uh, I think I appreciated very much this later years in life that we had the background and bringing up that we had at that time. Well, um, what, do you, what did you do? How did you make a living? How did I make a uh -huh. living? I have farmed all my life raised wheat, cattle, worked outside of the farm sometimes, and uh, I was, I might say, just a farmer all my life, livestock. I understand you know a poem. Could you recite that poem for us? Well, I'd be happy to. What's the title of the poem? You talk Carl. You talk Carl. Yeah. Okay, could you tell it to us? We will. <coughs> you ask me why I look so lonesome, why I am so sad, silent, and still, why my brows are always clouded like the darkness on the hills. Well, pull your pony a little closer, and a simple tale I'll tell. Of you took Carl once my partner and his last ride on the trail amidst the cactus and the mustangs of that Mexican fair land where the cattle roamed in thousands in bunches and in bands. There is a grave all unmarked by date and name. There's where my partner sleeps in silence. There's where and whence I came. Many years we roamed and ranged together, had ridden side to side, and I loved him like a brother. And I wept when Utah died. Side by side we rode the roundups, roped out and burnt the brands. And through the storms of dreary darkness, joined that midnight's weary stand. And when the stampede came so sudden, with the cowboys from the hills, there is a ringing voice that's silent. Utah Carl lies cold and still. It was his voice that controlled the stampede, and it rang out loud and clear. And when the cattle heard it, overcame with maddened fear. We were rounding up one morning, and our work was almost done. When in from the right, those cattle started in that wild and maddened run. The boss's little daughter, who was holding him that side, started in to turn the cattle, and was here my partner died. Upon the pony where the boss's daughter sat, you took Carl the very morning placed a blanket 
that the saddle might be easy, so I know his little friend. But the blanket he had placed there brought my partner to his end. Now there's nothing on the cow ranges which will quicker cause a steer to fight than some red object weighed within his sight. And as the blanket had stepped from beneath her saddle, catching on her stirrup so tight, as the cattle saw the blanket almost dragged on the ground, they were maddened in an instant, and they charged it with a bound. So the, they charged it with a bound. Lenore saw the threatening danger and quickly turned her pony's face and leaning from her saddle, tried that blanket to displace. In leaning, lost her balance, fell in front of that wild tide. While still Lenore, I'm coming, were the words my partner cried. And now about 50 yards behind her, Utah Carl came riding past, though a little thought that moment that this ride would be his last. Now many a time from out his saddle he had caught a trailing rope, but to rise the north full speed saw twas his only hope. Now the horse approached the maiden, sure foot and steady bound. Lo, he swung from out his saddle to catch the maid from off the ground. Lo, he swung and caught her in his arms, I thought he was successful and safe from further harm, but such a weight upon the cinches was never felt before, and as the hymen snapped asunder, he fell beside Lenore. As Lenore fell from off her pony, she had dragged the blanket down, and it lay there close beside her as she lay upon the ground. You took Carl picked up the blanket, again he said, lie still. He started across the prairie, and he waved it o'er his head. As he started across the prairies, every cowboy held his breath, for they knew the feat that he was trying was the feat of life or death. Now he had turned the maddened cattle from Lenore's little friend, and the cattle rushed upon him, and he turned to meet his end. Quickly from his holster, his pistol he had drew, for he is bound to die while fighting, like a cowboy so bold and true. As a, now the cattle rushed upon him, and my partner had to fall. Never more he'll sense the Broncos, never give that cattle call. For he died upon the ranges, and it seemed so hard that I could not make the distance in time to save my partner. As we broke into the circle, there upon the ground my partner lay, with a dozen wounds and bruises. His young life had slipped fast away. I knelt her close beside him, for I knew his life was o'er. But I heard him faintly murmur, Lie still, and nor I am coming. Those were you took Carl's last words. He had gone the endless trail. Now he closed his eyes on the final roundup, and his face grew azure pale. Now there's a great day and a bright future. I've heard that preacher man say, and I hope that my young partner won't be left until that last day. Yet if an unknown cowboy, he was ready there to die, and I know that my young partner has a home beyond the skies. Oh, that was good. How old were you when you memorized that? I think I was about 17 years old. Oh, for goodness sake. I've heard you refer to yourself as just an old steer roper. Could you tell us a little bit about that part of your lifetime? Well, I never did go in competitions such as rodeos. <clears throat> I had two neighbors. Both of them had a heart condition. And I'd help them with their cattle. Rope out these cattle. At that time, we'd rope and snub them up to post. Cut the old mechanical D horns, cut the horns off random and I don't know of anything I enjoy more than to rope a steer and work work the branding pan. I worked on a ranch where we run a branding iron most of the day branding cattle. Of course this day and age we put them in a squeeze chute and we do not have to throw them by hand as we did one time. 
Did you have some help branding the cattle? Well, on the ranch, of course, there was a bunch of men working, but when I helped the neighbors, just I, I did it myself. The neighbors, of course, their help wouldn't permit them to do a whole lot of work, so I did most of the work myself. I haven't asked you about your family, your wife and your children yet. Can you tell us about that? Well, I married in 1930, raised two children. The boys, pathologist at Scott and White Clinic in Temple, Texas. The girl is in Norman, Oklahoma, and teaches school. The boy has a family of, of uh, two children, a girl and a boy, and the daughter has four children. You have some grandchildren, isn't it? Well, I have six grandchildren, mm -hmm. three boys and three girls. Do you get to see them very often? Well, not too often. <coughs> One of them lives there down in Houston, Texas, and we don't get to see him too often, but some of them live in Norman, Dallas, Texas. They come up once in a while. One granddaughter just here about two weeks ago. This, but. Did you have any questions, Fred, that you wanted to ask? Can you think of anything yet that I didn't ask you that you'd like to share with us? Well, I did say about my father by himself when he came into this country. In 1900, <clears throat> he married my mother. She came down from Kansas here at this, at this place here, and my grandfather homesteaded, her father homesteaded, and uh, his wife had died a number of years before that, and he was by himself, and she kept house for my grandfather, or for her father, for a few years. And her and dad met and uh, were married and, uh, of course, raised a family of six children. And uh, they're both passed on now. Only a tombstone marker marks the place where the wild resting place. Certainly they were true pioneers. They never faltered. They never feared. Seem like never once did they feel like, oh well, we can't make it, we can't do this, we can't do that. Whatever there was to do, they just buckled in and did it. 19, 17 or 18, <clears throat> they built a little church in Mino. My father contributed quite a bit of money to it and worked, helped build it. And I thought they truly have pioneer people. They've seen the churches, the schools, the homes, the hospitals all grow up where once there was just a prairie, perhaps a few coyotes. Now there's a great state and I think we, can, we owe much to them. We can never forget what they contributed <clears throat> contributed to the growth development of a raw prairie into a great home. Yes, they were hardy, those pioneers. Your it, grandfather, uh, what about him? <clears throat> well, he came from Germany. <clears throat> he was a mail carrier in Germany. A veteran, you might say, fought in three different wars over there. I'm not too familiar with this that part of it, but <coughs> he was a veteran, carried mail, and naturally it, it seemed like, to me it seemed like the hand of Providence moved <coughs> and brought them hardy pioneers to this nation, and they contributed much to the development of what is now a great state. We do owe a lot to those ancestors, they, they yeah. did do a lot. Yes, I think we should never forget their
staunch way of taking care of things. I've seen my father <clears throat> put his shoulder to the wagon wheel and help the team start to load. And I kind of joked and said, if he said something about putting your shoulder to the wheel this day, they wouldn't know what you're talking about. So I said, oh yes, they'd think it was the wheel of a Cadillac. <laughs> well, it was an old farm wagon that he put his shoulder to and helped his team start it. And they thought much of their horses. Whenever Dad called early in the morning, knew it was snowing, blowing cold, get up, put the horses in the barn, curry the snow off of them. They took good care of it. That was their livelihood. That's what they needed to make a living with. And they certainly wanted to do everything they could to take good care of their livestock. Did he have quite a, a few um, horses or draft horses? Or? Well, the most I can remember was we had about 20 head of work horses, work that is work horses and mules, and uh, we had this one saddle horse that had a pony, and some of the smaller draft horses, work horses, they was made pretty good saddle. We saddled them and rode them somewhat. But uh, we had <clears throat> race real. First, they didn't have too good of a horses. They just whatever they could buy. Of the, they have a Bronco type. But uh, they shipped in better breeding stock and raised. I think remember one black team we had was really a good team of horses. You haven't told me about your cow ponies yet. Mine, what I have here? But yeah, about Baldy and those. Oh, my older brother bought this Baldy horse. They broke him to ride and took four head of work horses and Baldy, this saddle horse, through to Prairie in Texas. They drove a wagon with four head of horses, work horses, and that saddle horse through to Perry in Texas. And the younger brother rode this baldy horse back. And I still have the saddle. An old farm fit bronc riding saddle which he rode baldy back from Perry in Texas in about nineteen twenty five. What ponies do you have here now? Well, I have a little black mare and a white mare that I have here to ride. Do you ride them very much anymore? Well, I've said some health a little bit, give away from me a little bit, got away from me a little bit. I don't ride as much, but I don't think there's anything that I enjoy or seem to relax me more is to just get on a horse and ride. I guess it takes you back to your boyhood days. Dad farmed a farm a mile away from home, didn't have no fence on it. And uh, at that time the wheat was cut with a binder and shocked and the shock set on the field and they went and helped the neighbors thrash. Then come and thrashed theirs, probably a week, ten days, two weeks. Maybe had a shower or two of rain. Cab grass grew up, and after the shocks was thrashed off, this cab grass grew up. It was real good feed, and he turned the cattle out there, and I sat on one of the <clears throat> ponies out there herding cattle, and it seemed to me as near as I could remember is before I went to school that I herded the cattle out there on the stubble field, keep watching the cattle so they wouldn't get, get into the neighboring cornfields. He owned 80 acres near joining that. I'd drive the cattle at noon in the pasture on this 80 acres where they'd water, and ride home and eat dinner then go back and turn the cattle out on this stubble field. 
herd until milking time, <clears throat> and then bring them home. We milk the cows. And seemed like it. The reason I guess that I grew up somewhat of a cowboy is it was hardly a matter of choice, it was just a matter of necessity taking care of the cattle even in your childhood days. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other memories of your childhood you'd like to share? Well, I guess all I can say is just an average farm boy. I enjoyed school. And started the school, the high school. Father's health wasn't the best anymore. After I grew up, Dad began to get along in years. I left high school and helped take care of the farm. It was average farm life. Had its hardships and uh, good days. You weathered the storm, fed cattle through the snowstorm, but uh, I don't think I'd trade it for anything else to go back. I can't, but I, if I could, I don't know if I'd want to go back and do something else. Were there any real severe snowstorms where you lost cattle? No, I don't ever remember <clears throat> losing cattle through a snowstorm. We was always able to, <clears throat> in the wintertime, we had them on the wheat fields. And uh, some of them was milk cows, and we always brought them in at night, pen them in the corral where they had a feed rack full of straw or hay or something. So if the storm came up at night, why, well, we was able to take care of them. They had the little cow barn there where they could get in out of the storm. And even though it, I can remember one snowstorm, snow I, I imagine it's about 1918, that it was pretty bad. But it seemed like we was always had a big stack of good hay and able to water and feed the cattle and take care of them through the storms. Well, it sounds to me like you've really had a good, long, and happy life. What do you credit that to? Well, I think it's uh, nicely a child <clears throat> grows up under the guidance of his parents. Surely it was through the goodness of the parents who knew how to handle life and how to get along in life. And apparently father was a good manager in taking care of the farm and the family because we, about 1917, I guess, before we had any kind of an automobile, Model T Ford. Outside of that, we drove the horse and buggy to school or church. Mom drove the horse and buggy to town to take the cream and eggs, bring back groceries. And I remember just a youngster going down the pasture, bringing up the horse, harness it, hitch to the buggy and take it up to the house where Mom would take the produce and go to town, bring back the groceries. Sounds like you have a lot of good memories. <clears throat> yes, I. Of course, there are a lot of hardships, but uh, my father had a little saying weighed, weighed in the balance and found wanting. I guess the good part of life outweighed the hardships because you don't remember the hardships too much cut wood, <clears throat> take the running gears for wagon, take the grain bed off, go south of old home place in the timber, cut a load of pole woods, bring it home and after bring home several loads of it. 
neighbor would come in with a power saw and saw it up, and that was fuel for the winter. Life was very simple. Just, it didn't cost too much to get through the winter. Raised a lot of the food such as milk, butter, and eggs, butchered pork and beef. So it didn't cost a whole lot to keep the family going. Family was just pretty well self-sustaining then. They very it, it was self, very much self-sustaining. Very good. I guess the best food on earth is to be right out there on the farm. Mm -hmm. No additives, no preservatives. Mom didn't put any preservatives in that homemade bread. No. Like to have some of that stale bit. Yes. Slice of that homemade bread with butter, fresh churned butter when you came home from school. Got your piece of homemade bread and butter, change into your work clothes. He was ready to go do the chores until supper time. I see <clears throat> this day and age of daughter, their ones kind of beg the children to eat their breakfast. We didn't have to beg to eat breakfast there after you milk the cows, separated the milk, fed the chickens, and eggs. Out there in the cold, he was ready for breakfast. What kind of breakfast did your mother usually fix for you? Well, cereal a lot, oatmeal, bread and butter, scrambled egg, boiled egg, and more or less just kind of what grew there, a glass of milk. Seemed like we children all had quite a, grew up, I guess, with a taste, needed it. Use a lot of the milk, taste of milk. We used a lot of fresh, whole milk for our meals. Bread and butter, boiled egg, fish oatmeal, bowl oatmeal, and a glass of milk. I guess that's about as good as you can get. I think so. Can you uh, think of anything else you wanted to share with us that I haven't asked you yet? Well, not offhanded. Probably there is a few things that may be worth mentioning, but now, we, right now, I don't recall them. Of course, we did the average farm work. Walked behind the harrow, pulled by a team of horses, harrowed the corn. I remember when I was just a youngster. Harrowed the ridges of corn. At that time, grew quite a bit of row crop. I remember, it seemed like I spent a lot of time out with a team on a cultivate, taking care of the row crop. That was one of the places that broke the young horses or mules in the spring of the year before harvest so they would be broken, ready to go on the binder, headers, hitch them to the cultivator, or what implement we used to cultivate the corn, corn with, the corn calf corn. Did you have a threshing machine of your own or did you? No, they always hired a neighboring thrash machine to come in and thrash the grain. And uh, I guess it was about 1927 that they bought the first tractor outside of that farm with teams, horses all, the time, all together. Dry land plow, disc plows. When the land was dry, we plowed with this disc plow, and the uh, plow while it was dry, and when the fall rains come, it was ready to work the ground, get ready to sow the wheat. What was a walking plow used for? Well, of course, the early pioneers, 
That was about the first plow they could afford. It was a walking plow, sod plow, or known as a rod bottom plow. Just instead of a mold board, they had kind of rod mold boards. I even walked behind the <coughs> sod plow, plowing sod. And uh, but as I grew up, they had what they call sulky plows, single moldboard plows on wheel with wheels, pulled by three head of horses, and uh, disc plow, two discs on that plow, four head of horses on that. Anywhere from four, five, six acres a day was a pretty good days plowing. It took all summer, the latter part of the summer probably didn't start last it had the thrashing done and everything probably didn't start the latter part of July, 1st of August with the disc plows. took the 1st of September to get most of the plowing done. Mr. Peterson volunteers at the museum and he likes to take the children through the barn. I can see where he knows a lot about all those uh, implements, and children really love that. Hope you can get back to doing that, Ed. Well, I was taking a group through one time, a little girl came up to me and asked, she said, where did you learn so much about all these things? Well, I guess about all I can say, I just grew up with it. It's the only thing I did know. <laughs> well, I know the children love to hear you tell about them. Well, I enjoyed having it. I enjoyed taking those little children too there. They seem to love it. Well, if you can't think of anything else, I guess this is... Uh, can you think of anything else you want to tell us? I can't think of anything else right now, but I enjoyed it. Well, thank you for the interview. I hope it helps someone along the way to know where we came and where we might be going. Sometimes studying of history, some of the children in school thought studying of history was almost a waste of time. But I think it was one of the important subjects because we learned what didn't work, what did work, what we should do, and what we should do, I guess, I hope. <laughs> well, we certainly do thank you for the interview, Mr. Peterson. Well, you're entirely welcome. Saddle ordered from the Western Saddle Manufacturing Company at Denver, Colorado in 1924. It's been in the family ever since. It's known as a form fit. Bronc riding saddle. It has a 14 inch seat, 16 inch swell, and it's certainly one of the more comfortable saddles to ride in. And we've had it ever since. It's been out, to, took it out to the Texas country. My brother rode a horse back from Perryton, Texas. Rode old boy back from Perryton, Texas with this saddle. Mm -hmm. Picture there is a pony we called old boy. Of course, naturally bald-faced horse and couldn't come up with any name but boy. Picture's taken when I was about 17 years old. And it, he's wearing this saddle now. And he was a real good pony, but got distemper, and probably weakened his heart. He died and we lost the pony, which was a great loss. Here's a picture of my father and mother Charles August Peterson and Augusta Louise Peterson, their wedding picture. They were married in 1900. 
and this big picture taken shortly after when they, they were married. And <clears throat> on the old home place, their dad had dug a well by hand, 62 feet deep, with a pick and shovel down through shale. It was certainly a hard work, pioneers to accomplish what they need to accomplish. Of course, they needed a well of water, and he dug this well by hand, 62 feet deep. Whatever you want to say about it. Uh, are we on? Yeah. It's on. This is a cattle brand, my cattle brand, a registered cattle brand. My name is Roy Edwin. Initials is R E. I reversed the R and put an E on it. And uh, that's a registered cattle brand with a cattle brand of Oklahoma City.